Um, he is one of India's uh, premier security um, uh, analysts and practitioners, having been at the IAEA in Vienna as India's permanent representative there. Um, I did, um, we were having a talk upstairs, and I, since for a very long time we have wanted to make the point that our two countries are moving forward together, that the United States is paying great attention to India. I did want to call to his attention as a further example, as a further, ex <laughs> I'm going to do it. as a further example of our paying attention to India, many of you probably saw the report that India has emerged as the fifth most tracked country by the U.S. intelligence community which uses a secret data mining program to monitor worldwide internet data. India's number five. It's number five. I'm, we, we really do care about what you're doing, and you're moving up on that list. You don't want to move up to the top because Iran's got, Iran's at the top. But um, nevertheless, we might actually, after our education discussion, uh, we might want to ask him about some of these other issues. He did give a very important talk yesterday at um, Carnegie on does India have a nuclear future? Um, of course, we would like to ask him whether America has a nuclear future with India, uh, which is, I think, the issue surrounding the liability issue. We were actually talking about that upstairs. But we'll keep this on higher education, at least at, least at the beginning. Okay. So, okay. Um, let me also, uh, where is uh, Mrs. Srinivasan? Laika, uh, Mrs. Srinivasan is here. Uh, welcome to you. Welcome back to Washington. Uh, had many wonderful occasions at your home, and we all delighted to see you here. Um, okay, let me let me do a little bit of um, sort of setting up the discussion uh, this afternoon about higher education, because it is increasingly one of the key elements of the U.S.-India relationship. Uh, Ambassador Nero Pomerao recently said that she saw energy and education as being the two highest priorities for our countries right now. Um, Prime Minister Singh and President Obama launched the Obama-Singh 21st Century Knowledge Initiative. Uh, we just had last month the uh, Minister for Human Resource Development, aka Education, uh, and other matters. Uh, Mr. Raju here in uh, Washington to discuss um, U.S.-India education collaboration. In preparation for, and Molly Tees from the State Department knows this very well, uh, better than probably virtually anyone else in the room, as part of the strategic dialogue on June 24th with uh, Secretary Kerry, there will be the higher education dialogue. The third iteration? Uh, second. Second of the dialogue, and then there was the summit. Yes, sir. So, um, that will be taking place um, uh, in New Delhi. Uh, in February, Tara Sonnenschein, the Under Secretary of State for Public Diplomacy and Public Affairs, went to uh, New Delhi uh, to participate in an international seminar on community colleges, something that Mark Bruner with Senator Warner knows very much about. They've been leaders on that, uh, on that subject uh, from Capitol Hill. Um, Minister Raju, uh, when he was here, he talked about his vision for his ministry's policy for the current five-year plan. And just so you will know the range of issues that the minister is focusing on, his objectives include improving the quality of education through training teachers and enhancing curriculum. That would be obvious. Ensuring that disadvantaged groups and women have access to education, inclu including the use of technology in the classroom increasingly important component of what we're trying to do with education, and increasing the number of skills training programs. He aims to open 200 community colleges in the coming year in India. Through the National Vocational Education Qualifications Framework, he intends to impart India's youth with the skills needed in emerging markets and with a globally accepted standard. So there is a framework for the Indian government pursuing uh, these education initiatives. And even though you are higher education, if people did not notice the report that uh, according to UNESCO, uh, who has just released a report, India has made 
the most progress of any country in the world in elementary education. It says India has made the largest progress in absolute terms of any country in the world, reducing out-of-school children numbers from 20 million to in 2000 to 2.3 million in 2006. So across the board, the whole question of education in India is getting attention. So I am delighted that uh, my friend uh, Srini has uh, expanded his portfolio, as I said, to include the education um, beat. Um, we have included out here on the table his, his bio. Uh, let me just very quickly call attention to his service, not only um, before his retirement in 2004 at the IAEA in, in Vienna, but he thir served 37 years. He doesn't look like he served 37 years. How did you do that? He started at the age of 10. Is that right? Is that right? 37 years in the Indian Foreign Service. Um, Deputy Chief of Mission here in Washington from 1997 through 2000 with Ambassador Naresh Chandra, and that's where we were able to very closely collaborate for four years during those during the second term of the Clinton administration. He's been High Commissioner to Kenya. Uh, also, our paths crossed at the United Nations when he was Deputy Perm Rep uh, at the UN. Uh, he has been Ambassador to Fiji. Uh, he's been assigned to Tokyo, Thimpu, uh, Yangon, all of these places. So what do you do when you've had 37 years of experience? You write a book, right? <laughs> and what do you entitle your memoirs. Well, this is his book. Words, words, words. <laughs> Adventures in Diplomacy. Highly recommend this book. A great account um, by a, a, a great diplomat and a great friend. Um, he is, by the way, he's been on so many speaking engagements, he has told me that he is going to do a new book entitled Talk, Talk, Talk. <laughs> Did you know you were going to do that? <laughs> I got the idea now. Okay. <laughs> okay. I think I've got the idea, which is to say thank you, Ambassador Srinivas and Vice Chancellor, for being here. We um, like to turn to you now for your remarks about higher education, and then we will open this up for discussion. Srini, thank you very much. I'm here basically because Rick is here, so that's the only reason I... I'm here because I came here last year also to see him after he assumed this new responsibility. And as he said, we go back a long time to the UN days when both of us were deputy permanent representatives in, uh, in New York. And this was long before he became Mr. India. In India. He came to be known as uh, Mr. India. And in his room there is a cartoon which many of you may have uh, noticed. This was the time when Inder Gujral was the Prime Minister. So somebody is saying, are these brothers, Inder Gujral and Inder Firth? <laughs> <laughs> and this cartoon was shown to Prime Minister Gujral and he wrote on it, who knows? <laughs> so, so after that, again, when we were together here, we had very interesting things to do. So it's, it's basically a pilgrimage for me to come and see him every year at least, and that's one of that. And this time when I offered to speak at the Vadwani chair, I offered many subjects, you know, of nuclear issues, or India, China, or Japan, or whatever. And I said, I mentioned also higher education, because since I've been in higher education for at least one year, maybe. And he's quickly... <laughs> uh, took that as the topic. And the reason I'm sure why, why it is so, because he knows my views on all other subjects on earth. It is education only that I have not spoken in his presence, so he might have wanted to know what my sixth phase is. Because I say sixth phase, because when he was giving me a farewell at the State Department, he said he had noticed five phases of Srini, he said. I'm not going to recount that, but uh, so this is the sixth phase <laughs> <laughs> next time when you speak. So that is why I'm here, and so I have no uh, great expertise on the, on the subject. I have been in this field only for about a year and a half. Uh, and also, I'm not in the national arena. I'm dealing with education in a state. 
an important state, small state, but uh, on this uh, in the in uh, this field of education, Kerala has been in the forefront in many ways, and of course literacy and uh, various other things. And um, education, as you know, is a both a central subject as well as a state subject in the constitution. And that the division is not all that very clear as to what we can do and what they can do. It's a very comprehensive kind of cooperation between the state and the center. So I have been focusing more on what we could do in Kerala itself. And I have been, my effort has been to identify the urgent needs of higher education in Kerala specifically and the ways to meet them. Um, when the Chief Minister of Kerala asked me to uh, take up this job, I asked him myself, how come? What have I done to qualify for this? And then he said that uh, I want someone who has seen education around the world. He said the problem is that uh, we do not have a global view. Well, of course, I didn't tell him that when I was in Washington, I was not in George Washington or I was not in Maryland. <laughs> I was not even looking at education at all. Uh, but and that was the rationale that he offered, that uh, we needed somebody who had a global view of education. So I've been trying to justify it in various ways. And so I have just begun my work on internationalization of education, which is one of the points that uh, Mr. Palam Raju mentioned here, because that is one of the, one of the objectives. And um, so what we have done is the Kerala government has recently constituted an international relations group, which I, which I chair, which acts as a catalyst and coordinator for all the universities. Uh, there is collaboration already existing among these, between these universities and uh, foreign universities. So we have just started to put it all together as to how many exchange programs we have, how many students we have internationally, and what are the deficiencies, what are the openings, and specifically about three or four countries we have identified, United States being the first, then UK, then Singapore, Malaysia, you know, a couple of developing countries also. And uh, the Kerala government has recently uh, constituted this group, and these universities already have several tie-ups and with foreign universities, and one of them, the Mahatma Gandhi University in Kottayam, is part of my beat, has a project under the Obama Singh Initiative. This is the only project that we have in Kerala under that. Uh, we have students from various countries, including the US, and our own teachers and students do have opportunities to study and research abroad. We would like to see these expanded considerably, even as the bills pertaining to foreign collaboration are pending in the Indian parliament. That's a big question as to when this particular bill will be passed, uh, because there are so many vested interests, so many prejudices, etc. And uh, so it has been there for some time. And off and on, it comes up, some discussion, and it again goes back onto the back burner. Uh, but even pending that, there are possibilities. There are areas in which universities can collaborate. Specifically with the US, the exchange of Fulbright scholars has tripled. I think uh, Rick himself was a Fulbright scholar in uh, Scotland, he said. And uh, we are in touch with the US consulate in Chennai to explore new avenues in this regard. We, I come across quite a number of Fulbright scholars who come to Kerala. Uh, the mo most recent one was uh, Professor Behagat from the National Defense University, whom I'm meeting tomorrow. And uh, then two schemes we have recently drawn up, we have identified for further action with, uh, together with the US are India study programs in various universities to enable US students to spend a semester or more in Kerala, and a master's program specifically meant for American students. In these schemes, particular emphasis placed on Kerala history, culture, fine arts, indigenous medicine, martial arts, etc., for which there is a, there is a demand which will fit into the India Studies program of the universities. And this is where we have the biggest uh, uh, impediment, or shall we say, biggest issue, is how to convince American universities that uh, these are areas in which you can provide the kind of training, education, which will fit into the pattern of education here, in the sense that the credits transferred, how that curriculum is formed, how much of it will be useful for job seekers in the United States. 
And that is a hard job. I have been talking to a couple of universities on this. And they are very, very strict about these standards. If I just tell them, you can come and do Ayurveda or alternate medicine in Kerala, they are not very convinced. They would like to know what you will teach, curriculum, etc. So, and that is the process that we are going through. Uh, we expect to have these courses begin in the next academic year, provided we get uh, enough takers from the United States, with special, special facilities in the academic campuses, because we know that these facilities are not adequate at the moment. It's one of the problems that we have in most universities. We don't have the kind of hostels, the kind of food that we can provide to, uh, you know, sophisticated palates. And that is a, that is a problem. And we hope that India-US collaboration education gathers momentum. The universities in Kerala will play an active role. So that is my, uh, the limited kind of work that we are doing in this area. And moving on to the national scene, we have been following closely the development of education as an important part of our strategic partnership. And that is very significant. Uh, as reflected in the Education Summit in 2011, Mr. Palam Raju's recent visit to Washington and the expected exchanges in the forthcoming dialogue in New Delhi. As two knowledge-based economies, I think that is one thing which uh, common among between us. We have worked together in education even in the old days of the Cold War. Uh, you know, more students came to the United States than they went to Soviet Union, for example. So it was not an ideological problem at all. We have always had uh, close and uh, and, and intimate collaboration. And if you look at the, uh, the academics of Indian origin in the United States, you will find quite a few of them who had their basic, basic education in India, but with the opportunities they had in the United States, they blossomed into great scholars and academics. So the credit that we take for it is, of course they say that these people, if they had remained in India, they would not have been such great scholars. The answer is, but also their basic education was important. The fact that they could absorb the opportunities in the U USA. So we may have done something right. So I don't, con I don't subscribe to the view, general view in India that our uh, higher education is in shambles. I do not share that, that view. And that view has emerged because of the ranking system. We can probably discuss it if we have the time. And uh, everybody, including the Prime Minister, laments every time he makes a speech, saying that we are not on the list, on any of these lists of 200 or 300 or even 400. How come? What's happening? What's happening? This question is raised all the time. I've gone into this a little bit, but I'm not touching upon it now. But um, uh, the, the presence of this vast cadre of brilliant academics of Indian origin in the U.S. is testimony to the synergy of the past. And today, of course, it is estimated that about 100,000 Indian students are in the U.S., not counting the non-resident Indians. You know, people who have come to the United States for the sake of study, often paying their fees though, all the way through, is supposedly about 100,000. And uh, there are only 2,700 Americans. And I said this to the ambassador yesterday, she said, no, maybe it's a little more now. It's about 4,000, she said. Mm -hmm. But the figures that I saw somewhere was 2,700 in India. And they are only doing short courses. They don't come for degree courses, but they come for short, uh, interesting courses like Sanskrit or Ayurveda or whatever. Mm -hmm. So the full potential for collaboration can be realized only by the identification of complementarities in the two systems. And that, I think, is what is the exercise which is taking place. The long history of interaction between the academics of the two countries and the presence of the large Indian-American community in the US Together with the language advantage, because if we went to China, we would not be able to talk to them as much as we can talk to you, though we speak our own version of English, but uh, at least we have that advantage. So the presence of the Indian American community, the language advantage, and the identification of complementarities in both two, these two sides should lead to greater collaboration between India and the United States in the field of education. And I'm one of those who, who uh, feel committed and also feel encouraged by this potential. Uh, we have an eminent uh, educationist in Kerala, Dr. Achyut Shankar Nair, uh, who has been giving some attention to international collaboration. He's our main man in the Kerala University. And uh, after I came here, I sent him a message and I said, is there something that you would like me to say? And he said something very interesting, which I thought I'll read out to you. So he took a an image from the oil industry, 
talking about India-US collaboration in education. He says, whereas the US possess an excellent knowledge refinery in its university system, India has immense crude material. <laughs> so, and, and this what he calls human resource with great potential that awaits to be made the fuel of economic progress in the world. So I thought it was a very good imagery. <laughs> so you have the refinery and we have the crude. What we need to do is to refine it and present it to the world. I thought it was an interesting one I should share with you. And he also said the Indian university system is waking up from its slumber and positioning itself to leverage this. And so it's an opportunity and the, the stage is set and the willingness is there on both sides. So the mutuality of this endeavor is beyond question. The needs of India have been identified. So in this process of dual, what we can offer, what you can offer, our needs are fairly clear in the many reform reports available. And my responsibility is basically reform. I have no administrative responsibilities in Kerala higher education. My job is basically to see whether something new can be done. So we endeavor constantly to get our universities to the level of world-class universities, listed in world rankings. But more importantly, education in India aims at four things which our leaders always mention. Expansion, equity, excellence, and employability, the four E's which we are trying to get. We have accomplished expansion to a certain degree. Though we are below many developed countries in enrollment rate. So if you look at enrollment rate, it is around 15. So from, a, from an elitist education, we are going, moving to a mass education. And Kerala is better than the national average. Ours is about 17%. And the target for 2020 is 30%. And that is really, really dramatic. When Sibel was here, when Minister Sibel was here, he spelled out those numbers. You know, 4,000 more colleges, 1 million more teachers. Anyway, but I'm not a great um, uh, fan of uh, expansion beyond what is necessary. And uh, so uh, more than expansion, I, would, I think we have, it's not the new colleges and universities and new teachers that we want. I think what we need is uh, refinement of uh, the education system. In Kerala's blueprint for higher education reform, which uh, we prepared after the council was formed, um, expansion, uh, we have begun to address inadequacies. In what? Inadequacy of infrastructure, one of the main problems. In, uh, inadequacies of use of technology, it's not even 15% access to the internet. Then inadequacies in industrial linkages with the academia, and internationalization. So specific recommendations have been drawn up by my council on these all these five or six issues. And we already submitted reports to the government of Kerala on all these aspects, on, uh, on infrastructure, on technology. We have started what is called uh, IT at colleges program. Training of teachers, we are setting up a faculty institute. Research, we are giving a lot of importance. For the first time, Kerala has decided to give autonomy to colleges. We never had autonomous colleges in, uh, in Kerala before. Then we have a specific plan for industrial linkages and also, as I said, internationalization. So on each of these, what I did was, because I, couldn't, I didn't know any of these, so I appointed experts in each of these areas. And uh, we have submitted reports, and the government is in, this, in different stages of implementing our recommendation. So we have decided to establish um, uh, autonomous colleges for the first time, to set up a state accreditation and assessment council, because we now have a national accreditation and assessment council. But the University Grants Commission has recommended that there should be multiple bodies who do that. Of course, because, uh, so now Kerala will, for the, for the first time in India, one of the states will have an accreditation body. The national is called NAC, and we call it SAC, national and state. And uh, that is in the finalized final stage of uh, set, being set up. Together with, but of course, uh, this will, will supplement and complement the national assessment uh, rather than, but uh, we have given some uh, new criteria. Uh, we have taken the national criteria, and with that we have added some criteria of our own. 
uh, which is special for Kerala situation. Again, that we can discuss if you are interested because the Kerala system is somewhat different from the traditional education because we have what are called aided colleges where the salaries are paid by the government but managed by private. They are not private universities. They are as good as government but managed by private. So there are certain things that we have to do in terms of, uh, uh, you know, criteria relating to performance because of this particular thing. And also we want to include something which the national accreditation does not do is to uh, judge teachers to provide them incentives and disincentives. I think when Mr. Raju was here, I was told by the State Department today that he mentioned that there's been dramatic increase in the salary of teachers in university, which is very true. A university teacher uh, gets as much as the vice chancellor gets. This is because we brought in what is called the UGC scales. But the unfortunate part was UGC scales were given, but the UGC standards were never adopted. <laughs> so they thought it was a gift and they took it home, but nobody is working harder than before, I started off as a college teacher back in, uh, when was it, Leka? She was my student at that time. <laughs> uh, so my salary was uh, rupees 125, which is today's uh, rate of exchange will be $2 per month. That's what uh, I drew. And today it is 100 times more, a college teacher's salary when you, when you join. But are they teaching 100 times better than I did, is the question. I ask them, I keep asking them. That. They don't like to answer that. <laughs> they say, oh, that's a different world altogether. But there must be some relationship. Right? I don't think the prices have risen to 100 times in Kerala since uh, uh, 1966. So, that is, so, but, so that's what I keep uh, telling them, that they need to work a little harder the new more money that they're getting, but they don't say. But so what we can do is basically to introduce uh, incentives and disincentives. Um, I keep telling them the American model, where the teachers do not know whether they have job when the college closes. The next academic year, you don't know, isn't it? But there, once you enter as a lecturer, you will become a professor without any testing on the way, without any evaluation by anyone. And I told them that we'll start introducing annual contracts for you. They smiled, mm -hmm. but they, I knew what they would do. They'd get me out of that place <laughs> <laughs> if I try anything like that. Because security of a job is a fundamental thing for any Indian. So if I tell them that next year, I keep telling them my son doesn't have a contract for next year. He will only know it in September. They're not impressed at all. They said, we don't want that reform, they say. Uh, but we certainly need to bring in incentives and disincentives, which we are working on. And this assessment council will probably do that job. Then we are establishing a faculty training institute. At a time when the digital world is, uh, challenges, challenges the lecture-driven teaching system, we have to embrace technology on a massive scale. And uh, that is very low. Then skills development and job creation should be also a priority for us. So these are the... But I, why I, I spelt it out, because if you're looking for what we can do together, we have to see where we can assist in this process. So if you have identified the issues, and these are not very different from national issues, though I'm speaking from my Kerala experience, but the national issues are not very different. But needless to say, the US universities have accomplished most of these. Infrastructure, no problem. Technology, no problem for you. Teachers training, no problem. So all our issues are, are not your problems at all. And therefore, the possibilities of collaboration are endless, in my view. Time is not far when American universities will be able to open campuses in India, thus directly educating Indians in India. I think again, Mr. Sibel said here, don't tell us what education you can give us if we come here, that we know. But what education can you give us in India, is the question that he, that he asked, which is, very, which is a very important question, because the disparity in income, disparity in expenses, Therefore, it's important. And I think it was uh, Sam Petroda who said the other day, in India, you can get a degree for $2,000. Here, here you have $45,000 a year. If you, so you cannot compare. Therefore, we need to uh, think about. Uh, um, once the bill comes, I'm sure the American universities will, will open their doors in uh, India. Of course, there are difficulties, uh, problems, because these universities will not be able to make profit in India. Even if you make profit, you will not be able to take away from India. So who will come is the question that many people ask. 
But the answer is very, very good. Everybody wants to come. Even before the bill is adopted, uh, people are already looking for campuses, land in India, many un American universities. So they are coming not to make money, they are coming for a different reason. Maybe the, the raw material that Dr. Nair spoke about. And you can in institute some refineries and we can get these people out into the... Uh, the uh, several university research centers are already operating in Indian cities. Just a few days ago, I met the Columbia representative in Mumbai who has set up research centers in Mumbai. And, and actually, he's uh, giving those results to Columbia here to understand poverty issues. You know. oh. So that's already happening. And he's not getting any money from India. All his expenditure comes from Colombia, and the results are available to the Indian government, whoever else wants it. So, and that is the present stage, but that can move on to a greater stage of collaboration. The polytechnics in India, there's something called polytechnics in India, were actually modeled on the community colleges. Pe many people don't seem to remember it, but um, uh, when I look back, I found that it was on the basis of, we didn't call them community colleges, but they were called polytechnics. Uh, but now there is a great emphasis on community colleges, as you may have noticed, in uh, Sibel Stocks and Palam Rajus. So, and I think they even went to Montgomery, uh, you know, community college to study the situation there. So we may, so we already have polytechnics, but the difference between polytechnics and community colleges is there they go after higher secondary. They graduation is not necessary because it is a diploma course. Uh, so when it's community colleges, maybe it can, it'll lead to a degree and without losing the technical aspects or vocational aspects of it. Um, so the, there is a program of expansion of such institutions is on the annual to develop our workforce. The importance of creating job pools is a priority for both India and the US. Knowledge networks and th that link research institutions in the two countries will be of immense value. International research collaboration now holds the key to competitiveness in the global knowledge economy. And in the 12th, plan, 12th five year plan period, which we all keep repeating, this is 212 to 217. We have a specific program of allocation of resources. Special efforts will be made to strengthen international research linkages and involve a large number of Indian institutions in forging such links. Such collaboration will leverage the Indian diaspora, which is recognized worldwide as a powerful asset for research, innovation, and entrepreneurship. The U.S. experience collaboration between the academy and the industry should be of immense value to India. India would be setting up a body to promote such collaboration in the fifth five-year plan. The corporate sector could participate in existing higher education institutions by setting up of institutes offering degrees in specific fields, creating centers of excellence for research and postgraduate teaching, uh, establish teaching training centers to train, to train faculty, then appropriate corporate bodies in the U.S., such as the U.S.-India Business Council, should be able to work with CII and FICI, who are in the field. <coughs> in Kerala, of course, we have a big handicap here because we do not have much industry to speak about uh, because of our history of, um, you know, union problems and so on. But now we have a knowledge industry which is very active in Kerala, so we are tapping those resources. So what we are telling them is instead of coming and recruiting our uh, graduates from the campus as a great favor to us <laughs> and then saying that they are not good enough. So they should tell us what they want five years in advance and then we'll produce those. But provided you put your money where your mouth is. <laughs> and uh, that is the uh, idea that uh, we are developing. And Narayana Murthy, the Infosys chairman again, <laughs> so he headed a committee of the planning commission on this and he said that Higher education can improve only if 50% of the outlay for higher education comes from the private sector. That was his, his recommendation. But one idea I would like to try out here is entirely my own. I don't know whether this is any potential. Is outsourcing of U.S. higher education to India. If we can outsource so many other things, uh, why not higher education in India? You will smile because you don't know how, how it will work. But it's worth trying in my view. Uh, I think it is an idea whose time has come. As Indian educational institutions attain excellence, it will not happen unless our institutions are good enough for you. Uh, the IITs in India can match the best institution in the world, for example. You know, now it is more difficult to get into IIT Delhi than to Yale or Columbia. It's a fact. Some people who go, don't get IIT come to Yale. 
<laughs> so that is the kind of uh, demand there is. Um, so far, we have not been able to offer IITs to others because we don't need our own, we don't have enough for our, ourselves. Two things, medical degrees and IITs. There was no way we could offer it to foreign students. Even now, it is a situation. But we are pushing hard to open it up, even as a sacrifice, in order to get other countries, particularly the U.S., to get interested in outsourcing of education in India. And that will be like, um, uh, like I, 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 IIT graduates from India have had no difficulty getting jobs in the United States. Many engineering and management schools are already attack, attracting foreign students, like it has happened in the field of health. The availability of equivalent or even better services at lower cost should attract university students to India. This is a bit of a dream, I agree. <laughs> At the moment, it's not possible for two reasons. One, we don't have these seats to give, which will be a hard job. And the second, it doesn't have that kind of reputation unless you get onto the university ranking system. But in the, in the long run, now today, uh, it is a fact that people go for heart surgery to India for cheaper uh, and better service because nursing, for example, is much better in India than in uh, developed countries. So the, I believe even insurance companies are now encouraging people to go for treatment. It is already happening. Uh, there are institutions like All India Institute of Medical Science and others where uh, it is called medical tourism. It is not really tourism. You know, It is a, it is a medical pilgrimage, shall we say. Uh, whatever it is. So why not have educational pilgrimage or educational tourism to India is an idea which I had in mind, but I never expressed it anywhere for fear of being rejected outright. <clears throat> so a strategy for higher education, internationalization envisaged in India during the 12th five-year plan would include faculty and student exchange programs, institutional collaborations for teaching and research, and just taking it out of the plan. <clears throat> exposure to diverse teaching learning models and enhanced use of ICT. Globally compatible academic credit systems, curricula internationalization, and process of mutual recognition of qualifications are envisaged. The US, as the home of several world-class universities, will be able to play a major role in these activities. I have no doubt that these areas will engage the attention of our leaders and planners when education becomes the driving force in the forthcoming strategic dialogue. Thank you very much. Excellent, Srini, thank you very much. I do think um, your description of your proposal <clears throat> as educational tourism would probably go down better than calling it outsourcing to India. <laughs> the word outsourcing has a certain <laughs> has a certain connotation right now. We want to get away from that debate. So I think tourism, pilgrimage, as opposed to outsourcing, a better way to describe it. Um, let's go to questions. And Ray Vickery and I spoke uh, at the beginning that I wanted to call on him because he has to depart for another appointment. So Ray, who has uh, written on the subject of higher education and education in India. You, you have the floor. Thank you, Rick. Appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, always a pleasure to see you. Uh, I agree 100% that Carroll is the place. Uh, I made my first trip to Carroll in January. And everything you say in terms of educational opportunity, level of literacy, of course, is absolutely correct. And if it can be done anywhere in India, uh, I think it can be done in Carroll.
Okay, um, but of course, as, as you yourself know, the policy framework has to be central. I mean, it cannot be. But the good news is that whatever we are thinking of doing, if we just juxtapose it with the central planning programs, you will find that it's almost identical. So there is really no conflict between the state's aspirations as well as what the center wants to achieve. Uh, of course, about the university bill, uh, the, it is not as bad as you uh, seem to picture it because uh, according to whatever information we have, there are many universities who are willing to come even under those terms for the sake of coming. I don't know, this may be true, may not be true. And um, uh, the, one of the reasons why these bills were put up was also to regulate, regulate the current system, which is very exploitative. There are many so-called universities luring students and taking them here and there and then finding themselves abandoned. It has happened in several cases. If you go to Sarojini Market, you will find so many British and American universities' names hanging, boards hanging there saying, pay two lakhs of rupees a year and you will become a professor or something like that. Mm -hmm. So these things happen. So it is not only facilitating but also regulating was one of these. Uh, but <clears throat> certainly I also feel that there should be sufficient incentives on the part of uh, uh, foreign universities to come. But certainly the policy of the government of India as it is spelled out in the five-year plan document is to entice them to come. And uh, within those uh, things, whatever we have proposed so far in terms of policy, what we want to do sake of internationalization have been accepted by Delhi. There is no real. But we cannot give the kind of guarantee that a bill or an act like that will give to the universities. And that is not in our hands. But I have not seen anything today which uh, prevents or sur circumscribes uh, the freedom of the states to do what you want in terms of cooperation with foreign universities. So it's not, a, I don't think it is a problem. But uh, the problem of a national policy on internationalization is not in our hands. We can recommend, we have been doing that. And uh, we have been taking a very, very liberal uh, uh, position on that. And that's all already there. But I cannot promise you that we will make a plan and then that will help you to come. That may be difficult for us to do because of our, you know, the structure of our central and state governments. But education is the only area where there is not much of a conflict between the two. That is the, that's why I said was the good news. When everything else, there is a problem between states and the center. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to education, there is hardly any difference. Okay. I'd like to follow up on this. Follow up on this and then Molly after that. Basically, uh, I'm from the state of North Carolina, from Research Triangle Park. Mm -hmm. And we have three great universities there, University of North Carolina. North Carolina State He's, University from Duke. Duke. One is greater than the other. Yeah. <laughs> He's Duke. <laughs> and it's not Duke. It's not Duke. And it's not NC State. That leaves Chapel Hill. <laughs> Chapel Hill. That's UNC University. Yeah. <laughs> NC State is different. It's engineering. <laughs> they're, they're, all, they're all good. They're all good. <laughs> anyway, uh, last uh, spring, University of North Carolina system had a India-US summit on education. They brought the 16 campuses together to understand what projects are, what the collaborative studies are going on between the state of state universities and India. So they came to the conclusion that are eight, and they basically has is uh, put me in to facilitate a joint initiative between India and US in education. And I like to come to Kerala because I'm from Kerala, mm. and most of the time they go to North India, so I want. The big hub for education is in South, actually. Mm -hmm. Andhra Pradesh, Tamil Nadu, and uh, Hyderabad, and Kerala, actually. So my point that I'm trying to emphasize is that we have to see what's the value proposition for the US universities and the Indian universities. Mm -hmm. US universities, as you know, from North Carolina's perspective, the state has cut a lot of funds. And the state universities are suffering from getting money from full paying tuition st students. So they look at India as a good opportunity because India is, by 2020 will have 50% of its population under the age of 30, is that right? Yeah. So there is a big opportunity to bring Indian students to study in North Carolina. So that is the value proposition that North Carolina is looking at. In return, what we are also offering India is that University of North Carolina has a good program on junior faculty training which we have done in Middle East and also in Europe. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to extend that to India. And we are planning to bring 200 
junior faculties from India, and we had presented a proposal to the Minister for Human Resources on May 14th to see if he would encourage that. And if the funding is not available, we're also working with the World Bank to see if funds can be available. So it has to be a two-way traffic where everybody is benefited. So my point is that, uh, as Sini has said, that uh, universities are coming to India. I don't know how many of them, because I know Duke tried to set up a campus in Delhi, and it flopped out because of this issue. Do you have your card? Yes. Do you have your card? Yes. Can I have it? I don't know. <laughs> you don't have a card? You don't have a card? No, I don't. has come to you. Take his yeah, yeah, he I'll knows him. No, no, seriously. Yes. He's come he to North Carolina yeah, many times. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, because <That's> agreed. <laughs> if it can't be, you know, um, North Carolina and India, do North Carolina and Carolina. Sure. Beg your pardon? Have a sister state, a brother state. I would like to develop one. Actually, yeah. I was in Kerala. Done, done. Right? Okay, so. So before you come, he comes. <laughs> don't, wait, don't, wait, don't wait for me. Uh, that's good. Okay. But that's a great idea. Yeah. That's a great idea. But when you said I mean, two-way, you only talked about the students coming here and the teachers coming here. Who goes to India? That's what we are, we are bringing junior faculties. To here? To here, to train them. Because India needs both capacity and quality. So we no, need... No, but which is the two-way in it? Is that we are going to provide training to junior faculties. No, right? but what I was saying was this balance is the problem of... Yeah. American students not this going is there. This 100,000 yeah. versus 2,700. Yeah, 2, <laughs> I can tell you an example. In North Carolina, we have started an Ayurvedic center, okay? And the state of North Carolina is giving licensing for Ayurveda. And the Kerala University can meet those re requirements, and we can send students, students there. there. For yeah, that is, that is attractive to us. Okay. Oh. And I'm from North Carolina. I do have So if I come, <laughs> it's part of the two way. Part of the right? two way. So. <laughs> Very good. Thank Molly, you. Molly, would you, would yeah, you also introduce yourself? Uh, we'll start going around the room now, and if you could you. introduce yourself and your affiliation, it would be great. Um, Dr. Molly Tease, Senior Advisor for Education, U.S. Department of State. Um, and of course, as you mentioned, Ambassador Inderforth, I've been working closely on uh, U.S.-India building partnerships. I think so many of the things you say are exactly, you know, the things we've been talking about together, music to our ears. I just wanted to build on what you said and then ask a question. Um, I do think exactly right. The state, these kind of state-to-state -state and city-to-city -city relationships are really the future, okay? Ten years ago in India, I was working for the World Bank, worked on polytechnics there for years and basic ed. Um, we weren't encouraged to do state-to-state -state sort of things. It was all national focus, but that's really changed. And what I see is that through these development of relationships with a university system, and then that grows to perhaps the governor and a larger, the community colleges in North Carolina, that's where the deep relationships grow and that's where down the road, if regulations change, then maybe there's interest in establishing more of a, of a presence, you know, both ways. Um, it's great to see Mark Bruner here from the state of Virginia. They, are, they have done some amazing outreach and I think, um, you know, focusing on a particular state and leveraging the, the um, uh, sister cities, for example. You know, there are volunteers and they've got sister university programs, right? So these are long-standing relationships where people have, uh, they know each other already and are willing to extend it often to build in school and university partnerships. Um, you mentioned the India study program idea, and I didn't know how that might link. As you probably know, we have a large national resource center program called, it's funded by Title VI funding uh, through the Department of Education, and it uh, is really funding to make sure that there are enough Americans who understand foreign cultures and languages. It's actually that kind of scholarship how I got through college, studying Hindi. Uh, through a FLAS fellowship. So there are 10 of these centers around the United States that s have incredible libraries, resources, they teach Indian languages, and um, are a great resource maybe to build on for your um, idea for India studies programs because they've been going on for 50, 60 years. So I'm wondering how you see building up India studies here in the United States and. 
perhaps what we can do to support that. Sure. We went by the experience of Mysore University. One of our IIT professors who did uh, collaboration with the United States, he came up with this idea, actually. And uh, he felt that if we offered these, then the se centers that teach Indian culture and, and Indian languages here might find it useful to send their, their students at least for short periods to India. And yeah, apparently it worked in... They all have study abroad in India. Yes. That's where the 3,400 come from. That's right. Mm. research centers. But we want to build on that. So if we can find a way, maybe through your contact at Mysore or through particular connections to increase opportunities for American students... No, in fact, we are supposed to come up with specific proposals with specific colleges and universities in the U.S. in the next two or three months. Okay, very good. No, the consulate is also aware that we have been talking. She also runs the Passport to India program. I see. <laughs> so she, her idea is to get people over there. Yeah. Well, the I missed you this morning. It's government funding, right? Mm -hmm. And it makes this good business sense for businesses to fund American students to learn about emerging economies like India. Mm -hmm. So we want to work with them to get them funded so they can learn about But it's expensive, and there aren't that many specific opportunities. So companies like Honeywell, like United Airlines, like Citigroup are providing funding for American students to do that. Um, and the more that go, the more tell their stories, and they've really started a... So we create the opportunities that will become takers, that's what you mean? Absolutely. And who's managing the funds? Um, so the way the partnerships work is that the funding does not come through the State Department. There's no tax dollars being spent. This is just me matching a company with an institution or program of their choice or um, many of the people work for that company as interns. For example, the Honeywell Passport to India interns are working at Honeywell in Gurgaon <coughs> as interns, fully paid. But uh, United Airlines wanted to join the program. Well, nobody wants to do, you know, an internship at the airport at the Indira Gandhi <laughs> National <laughs> Airport at the United, right? So what made sense for them was providing free tickets for students who would like to study abroad in India but who can't afford it. And they chose to support students at University of Chicago and uh, University of Texas Austin Hindi Urdu flagship program. So students who wanted to go to India for a semester abroad can now go, thanks to United Airlines. Uh, Citigroup is actually funding the Columbia <coughs> University, Columbia Experience Overseas students that you met in Mumbai, and they're another one of our partners. So without the Citigroup funding from, it was Mr. Pundit's office, um, this CEO program wouldn't have had students there this year. We're really excited about that group. Not sure an internship at the Indira Gandhi International Airport is a bad idea. <laughs> United <laughs> Airlines, it wasn't their first. I'll work on Delta for that. Great airport. It's got a massage. Can you go in? Please. Uh, thank you, Raghavir Goya. Uh, my question is, Mr. Ambassador, first of all, of course, welcome again to Washington. And uh, we all miss you. I'm sure there's even Ambassador in the court. Um, I had asked this question in the White House when uh, former U.S. Secretary of Education, Mr. Bill Bennett, was speaking on the U.S.-India uh, education. And my question was that about the, and now he has written a book. I just got an invitation from him next week. He said that uh, I want to invite you for this, uh, is College Worth? That's the name of his new book next week. Um, same thing we are discussing here. My question is that uh, where do we stand now as far as the Sing Obama Knowledge Initiative was uh, announced? And also, of course, also we had a press conference with Mr. Uh, um They were talking about basically technical education for the masses of India. And I understand that uh, we, uh, like Ambassador India, was called about the higher, highest number of uh, school education in India but still masses of uh, Indians are lacking the basic education, which now we are in the 65 years of independence. There was a time when people were going for edu education knowledge and spiritual education and so forth in India, 
from all over the globe, but after that it was destroyed by a number of invaders uh, uh, by the time when India was invaded by so many. What is the future now for the masses uh, uh, in India? That's the, because education is the key, and, uh, and I'm sure corruption is also playing a major role uh, in India, and unless we control this corruption, then nothing will move. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Absolutely, uh, you're on right on track. Um, uh, but on the um, Singh Obama initiative, maybe she will be able to give us a, a clearer picture. What I read was 18 projects have been approved, $25,000, 250000 The second round of Obama Singh, Singh Obama awardees at the Higher Education Dialogue in June. Secretary Kerry and right. Prime Minister Singh will make those announcements. And our Mahatma Gandhi University is already a partner in one of those projects, I know. Uh, but um, uh, the impression I have about that initiative is this, it's just the beginning. You know, it's a rather modest program. Five to, million dollars from each side. Yeah, I know. It's rather modest considering the, the kind of requirements on both sides. And when you gave the names of your leaders to it, I thought it should be 500 million. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but that is the only uh, uh, you know, comment I had about that because it's, uh, it's, it needs to have many more resources than that. And um, the, the point that you made about basic education and uh, professional skills, I think is a big issue in India. I keep telling this to my, my own universities. The point is everybody wants to be a doctor and, or an engineer. They cannot think in terms of anything else. So if I go to the college and say that, you know, now you are in the BSc physics class, and this is not going to give you any advantage your education is not going to be of any help to you to get a job. But I have these positions of 500 plumbers and 300 welders and 1,500 uh, plumbers. Why don't you go for that? Nobody will go. Two reasons. One is there is no dignity of labor in India because we are associated with the caste system and various other things. So if you are a plumber, you should be born a plumber in a plumber's family. And that mentality we haven't overcome. And so no, no, uh, there will be no takers for the kind of basic education that Mahatma Gandhi suggested. You know, he said that at that time. Don't produce all these uh, clerks for the British Empire. <laughs> Educate yourself for uh, skills. Uh, but nobody listened to Mahatma Gandhi and nobody listens to me either. <laughs> so, <laughs> So that is uh, one big issue. So what he will do is he will go for his BSc physics, he'll go for MSc physics, mm -hmm. and then he'll become a plumber because there's no other job available. But he'll be an MSc plumber, you know. <laughs> so what, what a national waste to teach him all this physics and chemistry. Um, the, that is really the issue and also the salary structure. This easier the job, the better the salary in India, unlike here. Here the harder the job, the better salary, I, think, I presume. But there we have. <laughs> anyway, I tell them that. Whether it is true or not, I tell them, you know, look in America, the harder the job, the better the salary. I keep telling them that. I know it is not true entirely. I'm sure the vice chancellor gets more than the, 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 the woodcutter. <laughs> but, I, but I keep telling them that. Um, but in our case, the easiest job, you will not believe it. There is some system called Payment for looking in Kerala. Have you heard really? of this? Yes. I'm, for I'm looking. <laughs> Do you know how it works? I, I get a container from the United States. My personal assets come to my house. I mean, just giving an example. So the container comes there, and I have some workers who would uh, take this into the house. Okay? And as they do that, a group of people will arrive. And they say, we are in charge of this area. And uh, we are entitled to this job. Okay. So then we say, all right, you do that job. He said, no. You will do the job, but you will pay us. <laughs> really, it exists. It exists literally. Many governments have said, no, we'll abolish this looking charges. You know. And they only look. They will not do anything. And the charges are fixed. Mafia. <laughs> yeah. well, it's not even mafia. It's unions. You know. So I give that example as... So the easiest the job, the best paid. 
So when it happens, everybody would want to have that job rather than a plumbers or a welders. So it's a, I mean, I would not have said it in a purely Western audience because they wouldn't uh, even understand it. Uh, but, uh, but this is the system. And therefore, when you talk about basic education, we have to bear that in mind. And um, so when you talk about employability, everybody is talking about a white collar job. Nobody is looking for a blue collar job. And they are willing to do that not in Kerala, but they are willing to do it in the Gulf. You know, they will go to the Gulf and do the plumber's job and the welder's job because this uh, this dignity of labor doesn't apply there. There is dignity of labor, or at least there are people back home don't know. So that is why basic education has failed, and uh, everybody aspires to be an Einstein. And so, but then they realize that. That's too much, and so then they go for something. And even even my own father would not have allowed me to go and become a plumber at the age of 15. If, even if somebody had told me that is your level level of capability, he'll say, no, but I'll try. I'll send him to the university and see what happens. So this is a big issue. It's a mindset issue in uh, education in India. That's we have to deal with it. Mm. As opposed to a Germany, which has a mentality of higher education, vocational education, apprenticeships, these things are seen as honorable professions. And people get diverted into one or the other, and they yeah. make a living, provide for a family and the rest. Uh, and it's not seen as something to look down upon. Or a shame, shame on the family. Or a shame on the family. So, Still true. Yeah, interesting. That's why the Germans do better than us. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay, no, my, I think I'm about to say no, 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 unless you hire somebody's granny's nanny out in Fairfax, Virginia or something. But the idea of, you know, to bring the great elements, just like these Confucius Institutes do, they have the scrolls, they do a tea ceremony, it's Will all, by the Chinese yes, dollar? sir, four billion dollars of cultural diplomacy money yeah. a year. Well, they do have Hindi at USDA, and I've done Hindi in Mandarin. Well, do there, there, there you go. students, year one in Mandarin, Four in Hindi, there you so there's go. not an interest in it yet. I think I think it's a it's a chicken and the egg. Yeah. I do think more mm. the potential is there. The, when the Kennedy Center hosted the India event, I sillily thought I could take my kids and family. The lines, as if you tried to get there, the lines were all the way past yeah. the State Department. Just a thought. Yeah. Well, I do have. Yeah, I did want to say uh, just just one point for the you know Ray talked about some ways that you know hopefully states could be more progressive in pressing the center. There's one particular issue that I've been following very closely, Rick Rosso with McClarty Associates, um, which is um, uh, one thing that companies hate is this two percent mandatory CSR initiative in the company's bill, but it's going to happen. Um, something the finance minister mentioned in his budget speech, though, that I think is very very interesting, is that that money could potentially be used to fund um, uh, business incubators at universities. That could be a huge door opening to a tremendous source of funding. And so many of America's greatest companies that we take great pride in internationally were, were built in these business incubators at universities. The policy framework around that and what qualifies for it and will it be a, a, an attractive system for companies to use the CSR mandate or CSR generally to fund those incubators is still very unclear. but. Could be a great role, I think, to open up a new avenue for some funding uh, for the universities in Kerala um, by by helping to uh, to supplement and, and shape that policy. I think so. Um, I did want to say too that on the uh, the corporate ask a question on corporate skills development. You talked about having companies address universities with some of the skills they're going to need in the future, and that's certainly very critical. But I'm wondering um, with with certain education mandates in some industries. You know, I spent a number of years working at New York Life on their international business development, and we'd put through 150,000 agents in India through 50 to 100 hours of agent training, and it was a huge, I mean, we had to set up practically our own university system in India um, to put that many people through. And I was always raising, why don't you talk to universities, that kind of stuff, and there always seemed to be kind of a bright line, but a lot of industries in India have these mandates of, of, of startup education to get a license and ongoing education. Um, has there been much in engagement uh, with those groups? Not so much, you know, teaching them the technical skills to enter the workforce, but the ongoing skills. Has that been uh, an area that, univer that uh, companies have approached you about shaping curriculum for ongoing education, that kind of stuff? Well, they do, but I don't think there's a program as yet. Hmm. The, the leading in this is Tata's. Yeah. Uh, Ram Gobai was the, the head of the Tata's. He's now into skills training and he's uh, raising resources from the private industry and getting into the university. And that we have adopted that program in Kerala for hmm. skill development. And uh, funding comes not only from the industry but also from the government. And the beginning has been made. But this is new. Industrial involvement in education is very, very new. Yeah. I just couldn't understand. I mean, it, all these training centers all throughout the country that we'd set up from scratch and professors at each one teaching the basics and it's like there's it's school basics. yeah not New York specific, you, you, you take well yeah because you I mean you have to but give somebody that's the training at the end from from whatever they had to being able to go out and sell an insurance policy so teaching them about the basics on finance that kind of stuff so no, it was see, then that's basic stuff. yeah, yeah. That's multi-track diplomacy. Uh, my question uh, has to do with uh, traditional Indian knowledge, and I'm not sure if I missed this. Um, it, I heard about the Ayurveda Center that's being um, opened in North Carolina. So my question here is uh, whether you think there's any opportunity for uh, India and the US to collaborate in terms of uh, advancing Indian traditional Indian knowledge through the use of modern technology where the US uh, is a leader. And we uh, maybe that's happening uh, a little bit, beginning to happen with the Ayurveda centers because it seems like uh, traditional Indian knowledge in various sectors uh, completely stopped uh, with the advance of Western knowledge in terms of whether it's allopathy or uh, even if you go to architecture, um, 
I uh, recently read about how uh, architecture in traditional desert uh, regions of uh, India used uh, kept the uh, structures cool by through uh, the flow of water under the structure. Now, uh, knowledge like that kind of stagnated, did not advance. Uh, is there any scope for uh, collaboration in terms of using modern technology to engage traditional uh, Indian knowledge to see if that can go further? And as it seems like there's demand when you see all of the uh, tourism that's happening, uh, uh, medical tourism in terms of uh, Western um, people coming to uh, for healing to Kerala. Similarly, in, it seems when you look at the current um, uh, uh, buildings or structures in India, and if, if you look at uh, sustainability, you're looking at a country that has hot climate, but you, the wind it's closed. And the energy you use in terms of air conditioning and all the rest of it does not make sense. Uh, and it seems like we did not sufficiently engage or we stopped engaging in the advancement of traditional knowledge that's indigenous. And that uh, would be, uh, I feel, of use. So I'm wondering if there's any scope for collaboration in that area because the US is a leader as far as technology goes. So can we use technology and apply it to these traditional areas for advancing it further? In fact, it is happening in a big way, in the sense that if you now go to Kotakal, for example, the, the original place for Ayurveda, you will find the technology they use is not the ones that they used uh, originally. The medicines are the same, but the ingredients are the same, but the tablets are much more sophisticated. There is greater amount of diagnosis done, and so on. So it is happening, and definitely it has to increase in order to attract because there are certain countries where Ayurveda is not even allowed to be practiced because it is not considered sophisticated enough. So, so it is a beginning of a process, and um, it, it can only do go happen through uh, greater collaboration with through countries. So this is very important. And once we have more requirements, say, for example, Ayurveda, then naturally people will invest more in technology. So it's a two-way. And uh, that's already happening in the traditional areas. Uh, technology is being used to a great extent. And uh, this kind of collaboration, if it takes place, that will even help more in the future. I'd like to add an example of reverse engineering. In the state of Andhra Pradesh, they have a lot of problems with lead in the water. They use mud pots to percolate the water through to get rid of the lead. And the state of Virginia had the same problem in the southern part of Virginia. And they have adopted that technology. They were using heavy expensive membranes to sort of remove the lead, but now they're using mud pots to. So is there a scope for this happening at the university level? I, I know of NGOs and small yeah. people that are I, getting I think into Indian this government kind of should take because initiative. we seem to have caught the attention at the policy level, whether it's the central government or, you know, and get it into the university uh, system. We have a last question. Uh, thank you, uh, Rick. Uh, good to see you again, TP. And uh, simple question. We have talked about variety of in US, India, India itself, uh, issues of higher education. Can you tell me what is the low-hanging fruit that we can immediately put to use or go after it and that will have a big impact? What I outlined, the long-hanging fruit that we are looking for. No, 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 no <laughs> not too many. I mean, so I, I probably lowest, am very... the lowest? Yeah, the lowest, <laughs> lowest is having these uh, semesters in India for India studies. And, uh, and maybe some courses to be designed in order to attract American students to India. Those are the immediate things that we are doing. So, and that, that we are working on it very diligently on that. Maybe next year when I come, I'll come and tell you that, yes. Excellent. <laughs> um, I th if we can get your remarks, yes, like I have to put them on our website for all of you to be able to have access to. And we'll also put uh, Vice Chancellor Srinivasan's uh, coordinates and contact information. So when you make your next travel to India, come to Kerala. Can I invite them on your behalf? Yes, absolutely. Come to absolutely. He's not going to put you up. I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Not, yeah. But he would love to see you, collaboration, yes. all of you that are involved in India, yeah, and just education. Him on Twitter as well. 
<laughs> He's my follower. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Do, do that. Uh, but I think that we all have an excellent contact on this particular subject, as well as others, uh, in Kerala. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.